Our next speaker is Halima Hima, who is from Niger, where she served as the first president of the Youth Parliament. She has worked with UNICEF, where she co-directed a national initiative seeking to ensure youth participation in civic and public life. Halima is a candidate for a Master in Public Policy at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. She will speak of the world of rural girls for eight minutes. Halima? Thank you. What do you do when what you seem to advocate for or work towards goes against the very values of a community? Do you give up and let practices be? Or do you persevere, even if you know that you would face fierce opposition, that you may face insults quoted in nice proverbs in some context? or that there will be moments when you yourself question why you do what you do. My encounters with Rabi, a 15-year-old uh, from Niger, in southern Niger, gave me answers. I met Rabi and her family up as part of my work at UNICEF in Niger. Rabi was 15 years old when her grandmother announced that she was soon to be a bride. And she's not alone. In my country alone, three in three girls get married by the age of 15. By the age of 15. Now, by the time we host the sixth Women Deliver, if current trends continue, worldwide, 140 million girls would be child brides, 50 million of whom are under 15. And paradoxically, in the case of my country, two-thirds of the poorest in rural areas are women. Now, in my various conversations with women all over the country, they would tell you that they clearly understand the links between poverty and lack of education for girls. A group of women that I discussed with put it best. They said, when a girl is taken out of school, the entire community loses. That girl could have been the nurse that healed our community. That girl could have been the teacher that passed on knowledge to our children. That girl could have been the midwife that welcomed new life into our community. And the women also added that they know and they have seen that when a girl is educated, she thinks first about her parents. Boys, they said, have other priorities. Now, to the men in the audience, I'm only reporting what I've been told. In a conversation with Rabi's grandmother, I tried to understand if the, value, if the importance of girls' education is so potent, and if everybody, even in, in, in rural areas, seems to understand the importance of educating girls, then why do so many parents and grandparents choose marriage over education for girls as early as 15 years old. So I asked Rabi's grandmother. She responded with a question. How old are you, she asked, in the manner of African grandmothers. When I told her my age, she laughed. And she told me that even by the time I started growing my baby teeth, she had started losing hers from old age. I joked that she had probably lost them from eating hard bones in peanut sauce. Then the ice melted, and real conversation started. Rabi's grandmother talked to me about fears. What if she said Rabi comes home pregnant? She also talked to me about difficulties she's having raising her daughter, taking care of her granddaughter. She also talked about traditions. She said, well, I got married at 15, so did Rabi's mother, and so will Rabi. Now, in the case of this girl, she ran away to her grandfather. 
He's pictured here in the second picture. Rabbi's grandfather was her greatest social ally. Oftentimes, as we devise programs, we tend to overlook these people. Where are the men in the program when they themselves happen to be sometimes people who are pushing these girls to go forward with their studies? I would like to further contrast Rabbi's story with that of two other girls, Zainab here. <coughs> Sorry, the picture is slightly cut. But Zainabu is also a 15-year-old in southern Niger. She was determined to continue her education because she told me that she knew that the future of her community and her future rested on what she did today. And in, also in, that, in her case as well, she had the support of her father. And there was Ravi. Now, the third girl that's pictured here is called Sadia. Unlike the two other girls, she was married at 15, and she was already pregnant by her first child by the time I left home. Sadia, despite her story, to me represents the future, because she told me that no matter what happens, she will make sure that her daughter goes to school farther than she did. She will make sure that whichever opportunities she was not able to get access to, her daughter will have access to that. She will make sure that tradition and excuses that people use under the guise of religion will not be an excuse that people will use on her daughter. She will make sure that her daughter goes to school and stays farther than she did. To me, she is the future. And that day, despite the many challenges, I knew and know that a new dawn will shine on rural areas because these women, these young girls, have decided so. At this conference here that brings us together, where we're supposed to deliver for women and, girl, and girls, I had wondered, but where are the voices of these girls? I had hoped to see a panel of girls standing here, telling us their stories. So I brought you that of one girl, Zainabu, that I mentioned earlier, who talks to us about her hopes for the future and what she wants to achieve. Voir des gens instruits et ils me donnent du courage et la volonté de devenir comme eux. J'aimerais être un modèle et que les gens qui me voient aient envie de faire comme moi. It's very short, but to me, this is very powerful. As a young woman who also grew up in Niger, I can see part of my own stories in the stories of all these girls. When my father put his foot down and decided that marriage could wait for me, he set me free to follow my dreams. He set me free to go after what I had wanted. And I'm humble enough to say that I'm the first woman from my country to ever enter the gates of Harvard University. I hope not to be the last. And the Since we don't have much time, I would like to call on the young people sitting here to look back at ourselves where we were at five years ago or 10 years ago when we were teenagers and to look forward 50 years ahead where Dr. Essay and some of our elders are today. What story do we want to tell our children? What do we want to see? We do not want to have to give any more excuses. This is our moment. This is our time. And if we do not make it happen, nobody will. And if we do not make it happen, we have no excuses for excuses. Thank you. <laughs>